is there a lot of technical challenges to go from hydraulic to electric? You know, I had been in love with hydraulics and still uh, love hydraulics. Uh, you know, it's it's a great technology. It's too bad that the somehow the the world out there looks at it like it's old fashioned or that it's um, icky. And it's true that you do. It is very hard to keep it from having some amount of dripping from time to time. Uh, but if you look at the performance, uh, you know how strong you can get in a lightweight package. And of course, we did a huge amount of innovation. Most of hydraulic uh, control, that is the valve that controls the flow of oil, had been designed in the 50s for airplanes. Mm -hmm. It had been made robust enough, safe enough, that you could count on it so that humans could fly in airplanes. And very little innovation had happened. You know, that might not be fair to the people who make the valves. I'm sure that they did innovate, but the basic design had stayed the same and there was so much more you could do. And so our engineers designed valves, uh, the ones that are in, uh, uh, in Atlas, for instance, that had new kinds of circuits. They sort of did some of the computing that could get you much more efficient use. They were much smaller and lighter so that the whole robot could be smaller and lighter. Uh, we made a hydraulic power supply that had a bunch of components integrated in this tiny package. It's about this big, you know, the size of a football. It weighs five uh, kilograms and it produces five kilowatts of power. Of course, it has to have a battery uh, operating, but it's got a motor, a pump, filters, heat exchanger to keep it cool, some valves, all of it, all in this tiny little package. So hydraulics, you know, could still have a ways to go. One of the things that stands out about the robots. Boston Dynamics have created is how beautiful the movement is, how natural the walking is and running is, even flipping is, throwing is. So maybe you can talk about what, what's involved in making it look natural. Well, I think having good hardware is part of the story and people who think you don't need to innovate hardware anymore are wrong, in my opinion. Um, so I think one of the things certainly in the early years for me taking a dynamic approach where you think about what's the evolution of the motion of the thing going to be uh, in the future and having a prediction of that that's used at the time that you're giving signals to it, as opposed to it all being servoing, which is servoing is sort of backward looking. It says, okay, where am I now? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and adjust for that. But you really need to think about what's coming. So how far ahead do you, do you have to look? In time. Uh, it's interesting. I think that the number is only a couple of seconds for spot. So there's a limited horizon uh, type approach where you're recalculating, assuming what's going to happen in the next uh, second or second and a half. And then you keep iterating, you know, at the next, even though a tenth of a second later, you'll say, okay, let's do that again and see what's happening. And you're looking at what the obstacles are, where the feet are going to be placed, how to you know, you have to coordinate a lot of things if you have obstacles and you're balancing at the same time. And it's that uh, limited horizon type calculation that's doing a lot of that. But if you're doing something like a somersault, you're looking out a lot further, right? If you want to stick the landing, yeah. you have to get the right, you, know, you have to, at the time of launch, have, uh, you know, momentum and uh, uh, rotation, all those things coordinated so that a landing is within reach. How hard is it to stick a landing? I mean, that's very much under actuated. Like you, once you've in the air, you don't have as much control about anything. So how hard is it to get that to work? You First of all, did flips with a hopping robot. If you look at the first time we ever made a robot do a somersault, it was in a planar robot. You know, it had a boom. Uh, so it, could only, it was restricted to the surface of a sphere. We call that planar. So it could move fore and aft. It could go up and down, and it could rotate. And so the calculation of what you need to do to get a to stick a landing isn't all that complicated. You have to look at you know you have to get time to make the rotation. So how hard you jump, how high you jump, gives you time. Uh, you look at how quickly you can rotate. And so you know if you get those two right, then when you land, you have the feet in the right place. And you have to get rid of all that rotational and uh, linear momentum, but you know, that's not too hard to figure out. And we made, you know, back in uh, about 1985 or six, I can't remember, we had a simple robot doing somersaults. To do it in 3D, 
really the calculation is the same. You just have to be balancing in the other degrees of freedom. If you're just doing a somersault, it's just a, a planar thing. When Rob was my graduate student and we were at MIT, which is when we made you know, a two-legged robot do a 3D somersault for the first time. Um, there, we, in order to get enough rotation rate, you needed to do tucking also. Uh, you know, withdraw the legs in order to accelerate it. And he did some really fascinating work on on how you stabilize more complicated maneuvers. You remember he was a gymnast, a champion gymnast before he'd come to me. So he had <laughs> he had the physical abilities and he was a you know an engineer so he could translate some of that into the math and the algorithms that you need to to do that. He knew how humans do it. He just yeah. had to get robots to yeah. do the same. Unfortunately though, when you humans don't really know how they do it. Yeah. Right? We we're That's coached, right. we we have ways of learning, but do we really understand in a physical in a physics way uh, what we're doing? Probably most gymnasts and athletes don't know. So in some way, by <laughs> building robots, you are in part understanding how humans do, like walking. Most of us walk without considering how we walk, really. Right. And how we make it so natural and efficient, all those kinds of Atlas things. Atlas still doesn't walk like a person, and it still doesn't walk quite as gracefully as a person, even though it's been getting closer and closer. The running might be close to a human, but the walking is still a, a challenge. That's interesting, right? The, that running is closer to a human. It just shows that the more aggressive and kind of, the more you leap into the unknown, the more natural it is. I mean, walking is kind of falling always, right? And something weird about the knee that you can kind of do this folding and unfolding and get it to work out just, a human can get it to work out just right. There's compliances. Compliance means springiness in the, yeah, in yeah. the design that are important to yes, how it yes. all works. Well, we used to have a motto at the Boston Dynamics in the early days, which was that you have to run before you can walk. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a good motto. Because uh, you also had Wildcat, mm -hmm. which was one of the, along the way towards Spot, which is a quadruped that went 19 miles an hour right. on flat terrain. Is that the fastest you've ever built? Oh, yeah. Might be the fastest quadruped in the world. I don't know. For a quadruped, probably. Of course, it was probably the loudest, too. So we had this little racing go-kart engine on it. And we would get people from, you know, three buildings away uh, sending us, you know, complaining about how loud it was. <laughs>